So today's speaker is Jeffrey Shalit, who's going to talk about doing additive number theory with logic and automata. So Jeff, please. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks for uh, uh, inviting me to give this talk. And um, this is based on some work that I did with Jean-Paul Alouche, my longtime collaborator, and Jason Bell at the University of Waterloo. And there you see a picture of the university uh, computer science building. Um, so uh, I don't need to tell people here what additive number theory is, but you know, study of the additive properties of integers. There are lots of interesting questions that one can ask. A lot of them are very hard to resolve and everybody knows about Goldbach's conjecture. Every even number greater than or equal to four is the sum of two primes. And there's Goldbach's letter uh, to Euler um, about uh, 270 years ago. Um, and um, besides whether or not things are representable, the other interesting thing that has attracted a lot of attention is how many representations are there? So Hardy and Littlewood, as probably everybody knows, came up with this asymptotic formula for the number of representations of n as the sum of two primes. And it basically says that this number of representations is pretty large. It's about n divided by log n squared times some constant, the twin prime constant, and something that depends exactly on the prime factorization of n. Um, so if you have a set then of, let's say, of natural numbers, what are we interested in? We're interested in which numbers are representable as a sum of elements of S. And we're also interested in the number of such representations. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus almost exclusively on the second one, the number of representations. So to introduce the notation, we're gonna have A be a subset of the natural numbers. And for me, the natural numbers include uh, zero. And we're going to define three representation functions. The first one, RKAN, says how many k tuples chosen from A sum to N? And then the two variations on this are we apply some sort of symmetry breaking. And if we put a little less than sign after the R, this means that I assume that the sum ands are strictly increasing. Okay. And if I put a less than or equal to, I assume the sum ends are increasing, but not necessarily strictly. Maybe somebody has their mic on because uh, there's a little bit of uh, distracting noise going on in the background. Um, so those are three representation functions. And they were originally studied by Erdős and Turan and their co-authors starting about to 70 years ago. So what's the motivation? Why would anybody be interested in studying these? Well, for R, it has a nice interpretation in terms of coefficients of power series. So here's, remember, R is the, the number of representations of N as a sum of K elements from A. So if you take your set A and you define the associated characteristic sequence A of N, which is just one if N is in A and zero otherwise, uh, and you make a power series out of these, so a, sum of a of n x to the n, then what is this r k a n? I'm sure everybody here in the audience knows that this is just a coefficient of x to the n in the kth power of the formal power series a of x. So then it's a kind of natural question. You, you have this power series, you raise it to some powers, and you want to know what do the coefficients look like? So for Goldbach's conjecture, we can form the associated power series, and then we can look at A of X squared, and Goldbach conjecture just says that if you look at the coefficient of X to the 2N, it's always positive. So they're positive, 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 and so forth. So as, as I said before, and as everybody knows, it, additive number theory is filled with these kinds of simple statements that can be hard to prove, but in a particular area that I looked into, there turned out to be a lot of long, complicated proofs uh, of things that were eventually superseded by very simple arguments. And I'll just give a, a couple of quick examples. So in one of Erdős and Turan's first papers on this subject of the R 
they said, uh, they proved the following thing. They said, suppose A is some infinite subset of the natural numbers. Then if you look at this R2AN, just to remind you, that's the number of representations of N as the sum of two elements from A. It cannot be eventually constant. So how did they prove this? Well, in their original paper, they used a kind of big sledgehammer, a theoretical sledgehammer to attack this with, which uh, about, uh, uh, you know, analytic from analytic uh, number theory, the Fabry gap theorem. But uh, just a couple of years later, Dirac, who, this is not the physicist Dirac, but uh, a different Dirac, he's the stepson of Paul Dirac, the physicist, and also the nephew of, of Eugene Wigner. Um, he said, hey, this has a simple proof. This is a trivial proof, because if N is twice an A, an element of A, then the number of representations of N has to be odd, because you can write N as twice an AI, and for all the other representations, you just flip the order. So it's going to be one plus an even number. So it has to be odd. Whereas if n is odd, the number of representations has to be even. There's no choice, right? Because you can always flip them. So uh, that shows that you didn't need, uh, you know, this is do this in essentially a couple of lines. All right. Well, um, in 1985, Erdős and Sarkozy and Shosh uh, proved that um, if this R2AN is eventually increasing, then the complement of A has to be finite. So that says that this R2AN is only eventually increasing in kind of uh, trivial cases. And so they had a very long, complicated proof of this, eight pages long. But then in 1987 to two years later, Bala Subramanian found a much simpler one-page proof of the, the same result. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show a couple of similar things today in addition to other things. But uh, the goal of my talk is to try to convince you that you can use tools from logic and automata theory to prove interesting and non-trivial theorems in additive number theory in relatively simple ways. So what I hope to convince you is that, that this gives, a, if you're an additive number theorist, you have a new tool that you could use uh, to supplement your, your existing toolbox. And if you're someone in automata theory, this is a way to say, hey, look, I can do this stuff with with what I study, and uh, you know, the, the, maybe this is why you should give me a grant to to study this. Um, okay, so let, let me just tell you what an automaton is for people who don't know. So it's just a very simple model of a computer. So you have a finite number of states. The automaton takes as input a, a finite string of symbols or a word. Um, there are other models of automata that use infinite inputs, but for now, I'll just talk about finite inputs. And these are chosen from some finite alphabet. So they might be zeros and ones, they might be A's and B's, and so forth. So every time this automaton, this computer, reads a symbol, it causes a transition, which is a movement from one state of the machine to another, based only on the current state and the symbol it just read. Now, some of these states are distinguished states. There are special states called the accepting states or the final states. And another kind of special state is the, the initial state. So what happens is it starts in the initial state. It reads the symbols one after the other, moving from state to state. And if after reading the entire input, it's in this special accepting or final state, then the input, the, we say that the input is accepted. So it's like having a little light on your computer that flashes green. Yes, it's accepted or red. No, it's not. So let's look at a quick, a quick example. Here's an automaton that accepts the binary string having no two consecutive ones. And here the final states are the ones with the double circles. So for example, if we feed in a string like 01001, well, we start in this state, we read, zero, one, o, o, one, and we end up in the final state one because of the double circle. Whereas if it, the input were zero, one, one, o, one, we'd go zero, one, one, o, one, and we'd end up 
in a non-final state. So it would not accept or reject this, this uh, uh, latter input 01101. Okay, so um, so the, the the kinds of sets of integers that are accepted by automata in this way uh, was originally studied by Bushi and Kabam in the in the sixties, and it was originally called uh, uniform tag systems. Now the name that seems to be a, a bit more popular is a automatic set of integers. So a set is said to be B automatic if there's a finite automaton that accepts exactly the set of base B representations of members of A. So as an example, let's consider this, this set sometimes called the odious numbers. This is not my term, but rather the term of John Conway. Uh, so I don't feel important enough to try to change it. Um, these are the numbers that base two representation has an odd number of ones in it. So this set then is two automatic and we just have an automaton which counts the parity of the number of ones goes back and forth between state zero and one depending on how many one is read. And if this number is odd, it's accepted. So that's an example of a two automatic set. By the way, you should interrupt if anything is unclear. Okay, now we can generalize this notion of automata to have automata with output. We add an output associated with each state and um, then the output associated with an, an integer input is the output associated with the last state reached. So here's an automaton that computes n mod three if the input is n in base two. And basically it just keeps track of as it reads the bits, what residue class the the current prefix of the number that you've read so far is in. And then at the very end, it returns it and it returns it in the way that uh, follows the, the number that follows the slash. So a sequence more generally over a larger alphabet is B automatic if it's computed by an automaton with inputs represented in base B. Okay, so now, Sort of what I'm gonna talk about is this free software tool called Walnut, which was written by my master's student, Hamoun Musavi. And what's nice about Walnut is that it can prove or disprove assertions about automatic sequences. So all you have to do is state the claim about an automatic sequence that you, you are interested in, in first order logic, and then Walnut will either prove or disprove it. And, and because the, the theory, the underlying logical theory is decidable, you're guaranteed that you will either get a proof or disproof. If it is a well-formed formula, let's say with no, no unbound variables. Um, so uh, the, the downside of this software is that the time and space usage bound in the very worst case can be very, very bad. So, so in practice, it's possible to make assertions where it just runs out of space or takes too much time to do it. But, but, but that happens pretty rarely for the kinds of things that people actually want to do. And so it's been used in um, many papers already in the literature. And what's kind of fun about it is it even found mistakes in other people's papers in the field of combinatorics on words because you would type in the assertion and it would say false. And then you know you, you can find the, sh the smallest counter example with it also. So this is a, this is a, a particular fragment of arithmetic uh, where everything you want to see, you, you, you can phrase, it, it can be proven by this decision procedure. And you might think, oh, you can only do really trivial things, but no, you can do many theorems that were already published and you can find new theorems with it. Okay, so let's look at an example. This, uh, this is an old result of Lambeck and Moser. They're depicted on the right. So they said, let's look at these odious numbers. Remember that's the number of one bits is odd. And let's look at the corresponding set, the evil numbers, the number of one bits in base two of n is even, and this is just some partition of n, right? 
So what they proved is if you count the number of representations of n as a sum of two evil numbers where you impose this ordering on the sum n, they have to be strictly increasing, it's exactly the same as the number of ways to write n as a sum of two odious numbers, again, with the same restriction. So they proved that about 60 years ago. So just as an example, if you think about the number nine, then the evil number zero is evil. Uh, it has zero one bits in it. Nine is evil because it has two one bits in it. Uh, same with three and six. So those are two representations. And for the odious numbers, there's one and eight and two and seven. So this theorem was later proved again by uh, in a paper of Dombey, a uh, paper of Lev, and, and a bunch of other people. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to prove this theorem, uh, which is uh, not strictly expressible in the first order logic that we have, but we can still attack it with Walnut because Walnut can do some enumeration in addition to its proofs of, of theorems, proofs and disproofs of theorems. And in order to explain that, I have to digress with a little detour into what a linear representation is. So what's a linear representation? A linear representation for a sequence f of n is a triple v, gamma, and w, where v is a row vector, gamma is a t by t matrix valued morphism, and I'll say exactly what I mean by that in a second. And W is a T element column vector for some T. And then F of N can be computed by forming the dot product of V with gamma of X and W whenever X is a base B representation of N. So I allow X to have leading zeros here. Um, now, what do I mean by gamma of X? Gamma of X is, well, if X is a string of symbols, A1 through AI, then gamma of X is a morphism applied to X. So it's just the product of the individual matrices of gamma of A1, gamma of AI. So what gamma does is it associates with each element of the alphabet, a T by T matrix. And then to apply it to a word, you just apply it to the letters and multiply them, multiply the matrices together. And this integer t is called the rank of the representation. <clears throat> OK, so that's what a linear representation is. Um, you may recognize this from um, something called the transfer matrix method. Are the a's in increasing order, or are the gammas commuting? The a's are simply bits, which can, in this, in it, it, if it's base two, it's zeros and ones. Got it, got it, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, or on a larger alphabet, they would just be elements of the alphabet. Um, so yeah, I, was, I was saying uh, you might be familiar with this as the, essentially the transfer matrix method. Um, that's what this is in, in, in other language. OK, so let's look at a linear representation just to give you some uh, some feel for what you can do with it. Uh, you may know this famous sequence called the Stern or stern broco sequence. It's defined by A of 2n is A of n, and A of 2n plus 1 is A of n plus A of n plus 1. And the initial values are 0 and 1. So here's a linear representation for this sequence. If you want to compute A of 27, you write 27 in base 2. What is it? It's 11011. And then you take V and multiply it by gamma of 11011 and by W. So it's the product of these three things. And if you work it out, it's eight. So th that, that's an example of a sequence that can be computed by a linear representation. OK, so now there's a really nice theorem that's due essentially to Bushi and Briere. It says that if you have an automatic set, then R K A N or R less than K A N or these three representation functions that we talked about has a linear representation. And not only does it have a linear representation, you can compute it directly 
from the automaton for A. So there's a, 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 a procedure, a deterministic procedure for finding this linear representation. And this is a specific uh, corollary of a much more general theorem uh, of Bouchy and Briere, which says that this is true for anything you can write a first order logical formula for. Sorry, uh, is the set A finite or infinite? Either one. So in general, I mean, if it's finite, it's not so interesting. The interesting thing is where, where A is, is infinite. So like the odious numbers, the evil numbers and so forth. Yeah, so, so the theorem of Bushy and Briere says, if you can write a first order logical formula, then um, you, you can find this linear representation. And if you think about our definition of RKAN, that's a first order logical formula for, uh, for what you know, saying that n is representable as the sum of uh, k things chosen from a that is a first order state. Okay, now we'll need one more thing. I hope this is the last thing. We'll also need a way to compare two different linear representations. So by compare them, I want to say that you know they represent the same function. Well, to start off with. If we have two linear representations, say for F and for G, we can form a linear representation for a linear combination of F and G, say alpha times F plus beta times G, just by using some block matrices. So we, we define a bigger vector, bigger matrices, and a bigger vector here. And then if we multiply them, we're essentially doing alpha F in one component kind of, and beta g in the other and adding them together, right? So, so th this is just some trivial manipulation on matrices that can be done in Maple and Mathematica very easily. Furthermore, this is a little less trivial. If we have a linear representation, we can minimize it. So there's an algorithm due to Schutzenberger for finding an equivalent linear representation of minimum rank. So we can find the kind of the smallest possible such representation. So if we put all that together, we can say if we have a linear representation for one function f and a possibly different linear representation for some function g, we can decide with an algorithm if f and g are the same function. And the way we do it is we just form this linear representation for f minus g and we minimize it. And when we minimize it, if it was zero everywhere, this would be the rank zero linear representation that computes the everywhere zero function. So one of my students wrote some maple code for that. And so you just do it and you see, is it zero? And it tell, then it tells you they're the same. Okay, so now we can prove the Lambeck-Moser result just using automata theory, logic, and some linear algebra. We just need to find a linear representation for both sides and then use the theorem I just talked about. So how do we do that? Well, in Walnut, we do it as follows. We say define evil sum n, the 2a, the, the 2a Morse function, which is the parity of the number of one bits of i, is zero, and at j it's zero, and i is less than j, that's the the condition that we're enforcing, and n is i plus j. And the odious sum is they're equal to one, and i is less than j, and n is i plus j. And what this does is it gives you back two linear representations of rank eight. And then all we need to see is that these compute the same function. So we, we run this, this minimization for the difference between these two, and it gives me back the, the zero representation. So that's the result. That's the la proof of the Lambeck and Moser. It's purely computational. You just type in the thing you want to do. You get back these linear representations. You run it through some maple code, and it says they're the same. OK, that was a result for R less than. How about R? This is something that was not in their paper. So the point is here is we can use this to prove some new theorem. Well, if you if you just play around with it, you, you quickly discover that R2 evil n minus R2 
odious mn is either zero, one, or minus one. And what is it? It's minus one to the two a Morse function at, at n, in other words, the parity of the number of one bits. Uh, if n is odd and otherwise it's zero. And now we can make a linear representation for both sides of this equation very easily. And for the this side, it might not be obvious because this is not something in the particular log. Exponentiation is not in the particular logic that it, as a permitted operation. But you just use the fact that minus one to the i is just one minus two i, provided i is in zero one, and then it is in the logic. Um, so we do the same thing, and we 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 can check that this is true. Now Chen and Wang said, "Okay, well." We, we had this theorem, this partition of the natural numbers for r less than, how about r less than or equal to? And they, they proved it using an analog of the evil and odious numbers. Their analog now is they're going to count the parity of the number of zero bits instead of the number of one bits. So now we get an E prime where the parity of the number of zero bits is even and an O prime where the parity of the number of zero bits is odd. For example, uh, 11 in base two is one zero one one. It has one zero in it, so that's odd. And they proved the analog of this theorem. And this was also proved by Lev. And we can do it in exactly the same way um, because this theorem is only true for, sorry, this th theorem is only true for n greater than or equal to one rather than n greater than or equal to zero, uh, we're going to just we're going to shift the indices by by one to get something that's true for all n greater than or equal to zero. And then we just do exactly the same thing. Here TT is this uh, modified uh, the, the, the twisted to a more sequence where we're counting the number of zeros in the base two representation of I. And when we do this, we get two linear representations. They're of rank 20 this time before they were of rank eight. And we use the theorem to prove that they're the same. So if you look at the proofs in previous papers, they're you know often two or three pages long, some complicated induction. So you know, this is a way to just, just hit it with a hammer that can handle all such problems. And it, and it kills them. Okay, so now I'll get to something where some stuff is not, still not known. So this can be regarded as a challenge to you as additive number theorists to, to solve the problem. There's another really interesting set called the uh, automatic set, which is called the Rudin Shapiro set. And it's named for Walter Rudin and Harold Shapiro. Harold Shapiro, by the way, has another connection to a famous physicist, which is that his son, is the physicist Max Tegmark. Um, so uh, the Rudin Shapiro set is those numbers that when you count the number of one ones that appear in the binary representation of n, this number is odd. So we allow these one ones to overlap. For example, uh, uh, in, in 15, how many one ones are there? Well, 15 in base two is one, 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 one. So the, the first two bits are one, one, the second and third bits are one, one, and the third and fourth bits are one, one. So that's three of them. So it's odd. Now, Dombey proved in a 2002 paper that for K greater than or equal to five, the function RKRN is an eventually increasing function of N. And he conjectured this is true for K equal four but still nobody knows how to prove this. So there is an open problem. Um, now we can prove using th this technique of Walnut that R3 RN is not eventually increasing. So in Dombey's paper, he just asserts this without any uh, actual uh, proof. Um, may maybe there's some very simple proof of this, I don't know, but here's how I would do it with Walnut is we're just gonna create a linear representation for this different sequence, which we can do because we can do uh, R3 of N, and then we can do R3 of N minus one. 
And then we can combine these with the block matrix trick that I talked about, take their linear combination. And then we get a linear representation for this D of N. And now all we have to do is find infinitely many N such that D of N is less than zero. Well, in general, if you have a linear representation for something, it's not gonna have a simply describable behavior. It can have really, really complicated behavior. For example, even checking whether it is always positive in general is not decidable, provably not decidable in general. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you can't do it in any particular case, but it does indicate that it might be hard for some examples. So on the other hand, for specific values of F, we can often understand them. Namely, if the, if, if the ends that we're interested in form a particular kind of subsequence, namely their base B representation looks like X followed by a bunch of Ys followed by Z, where X, Y, and Z are blocks of digits, then we can understand it. And why is that? It's because it's just linear algebra in that case. In that case, the linear representation is just V dotted with gamma of this number Ni dotted with W. And what is that? That's V dotted with gamma of X, which is just some fixed matrix, dotted with gamma of Y to the I, which is again, just the ith power of some fixed matrix, dotted with gamma of Z, W. I can say Z here because most of you are in the US. Um, and uh, and each entry of this gamma of y to the i, what is it? Well, by uh, Cayley Hamilton theorem, it's just a linear combination of the i powers of the zeros of the minimal polynomial for that matrix. So we can just ask Maple or Mathematica, hey, compute the minimal polynomial of gamma y, and then use uh, uh, you know uh, solve. For this, for this linear combination of the these zeros of this of this value, uh, with the first, you know, having computed the first few values of f, maybe right from the linear representation. Okay, so for this particular problem, we're interested in this R three, R n. So the number of representations is a sum of three things from the Rudin Shapiro set. The particular numbers that we need to look at look like Z, uh, Z, ZT, which is just uh, T plus one copies of one zero in base two. So it's just this number and this, this integer, two to the T, two T plus three minus two over three. So now if we compute the minimal polynomial of gamma uh, of one zero, here it is. It's this, this big polynomial. Um, and if you look at this polynomial, you see, well, there's a zero of one, there's a zero of two, there's a zero of four, there's gonna be three roots, three zeros here and four here. And so uh, this, this uh, D, which was the, the, the difference of the, the two representations, it's gonna look like A plus B times two to the T plus C times four to the T, plus linear combinations of these zeros. So we need to understand what those zeros look like in order to understand the behavior of that. Well, that's easy enough. We can just use Maple. I teach at Waterloo, right? So it's a, one is not allowed, even allowed to utter the name Matham. Or you have to use Maple. So using Maple, uh, the zeros of this polynomial are these guys and the zeros of this polynomial are these guys. And you can see that the dominant roots are the, the gamma one, uh, delta one and delta two. So that's all we really care about. Um, if we wanna show that this difference is, is not strictly increasing, all we need to do is, is show that it's negative infinitely often. And so th this D of ZT then is gonna be dominated by the real part of beta one, which was this coefficient on the previous slide, times delta one to the T. And this is gonna be large and negative when we're in the right sector uh, 
Um, and so this will occur for infinitely many t, and hence this d of zt is less than zero infinitely often, and hence this uh, r3rn is not eventually increasing. So there it's a you know, combination of using a little bit of logic, a little bit of computation, a little bit of linear algebra, and, and then just uh, you know, so something about the zeros of these polynomials. Okay, well, back to the 2A Morse sequence. The 2A Morse power series is the power series where the, the exponents are just the, the odious numbers. Um, so Jean-Paul Alouche proved, using kind of more traditional methods of analytic number theory, that the coefficients of t to the 10th of x, so the 10th power of t of x, are eventually increasing. And more precisely, he proved the following theorem. Suppose you have a sequence of plus or minus ones, call it q sub n, and suppose you make a, a power series out of these. Uh, this is the, the, a power of, uh, sorry, a polynomial out of the, the first n plus one coefficients. And suppose a is the set of all things where q of n minus one is equal to one rather than minus one. If you know that, sorry, I don't know what happened here. If you know that qn of z is less than or equal to cn to the alpha for some constant alpha between zero and one, then this rkan is eventually strictly increasing provided k is big enough. So if you take enough powers, uh, sorry, enough summands or a large enough power of this power series, the coefficients will be strictly increasing. So for 2a Morse, it's known that you can take alpha to be log three over log four, which is about 0.8. And that means provided k is, is, is uh, at least 10, um, then uh, you, you know that these, these uh, representation function is strictly increasing. So, on the other hand, we can prove ex using exactly the same technique that I, I just showed you for Rudin Shapiro, that the coefficients of two to the fifth are not eventually increasing. So the status of the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth powers of these, this power series is still unknown, whether the coefficients are eventually strictly increasing. It seems likely that's true for t to the sixth, but we've been unable to prove it. So there is another open problem. Now, the, the very last part of the talk um, is, is devoted to proving, uh, disproving a conjecture using all these kinds of ideas at once. So in 2002, Dombey in his paper made the following conjecture. Um, he was interested in R3AN, where A is some set of natural numbers. So the number of representations as a sum of three elements of A. So if the complement of A is sparse, then what do you expect R3AN to grow roughly like? Well, there are going to be two choices for the first sum and, and then the third one is fixed because they have to sum to N. So that, that means we expect that R3AN is going to grow roughly like N squared, very roughly. And so then what do we expect about the first difference? So if we want to know whether R3AN is eventually strictly increasing, when we look at the first difference, well, we expect it to grow roughly like order n, right? Because if you take something that grows sort of like n squared, you take its first differences, you expect it to be roughly like n. But of course, there might be fluctuations. So here, I took a to be the complement of the squares. And then I computed R3AN minus R3AN minus one. So here the complement of A is the squares and that's pretty sparse. So you can see, yeah, it looks like it's the, this difference is growing kind of like N, right? Looks like it's about, I don't know, 0.85N, but there are fluctuations. So it's not growing it's not strictly increasing. So there could be these fluctuations. So Dombey conjectured 
there is no set A such that its complement is infinite and R3AN is eventually increasing. But his conjecture is wrong. And here's a simple counterexample. Let F be the numbers 3, 6, 12, 24, in other words, three times the power of two. Let A be the complement of F. So A has a sparse complement, but, but infinite. And R3AN is strictly increasing right from the start. Now, how can we prove this? We can prove it using the machinery that I developed. Namely, we find a linear representation for R3AN because F is an automatic set. Uh, we find a linear representation for R3AN minus one. We find a linear representation for their difference. We look at that difference and try to understand it. We can guess a closed form for it just by looking at it. So there's a little bit of guesswork involved. Once we guess this closed form, we can actually prove that closed form using Walnut. And the closed form is strong enough to show that this D of N is always positive, And so it's strictly increasing right from the start. So what does the closed form look like? It looks like uh, D of three N plus I is about three N minus something that's about log N in size minus something that fluctuates. And the nice thing is the fluctuation is itself an automatic sequence. And because it's an automatic sequence, we can use Walnut to prove it. That, that, that it looks exactly like this. So how did I find this counterexample? I found it using, again, a computational procedure named some sort of intelligent guessing. Namely, I did a breadth-first search on the tree of all possible finite characteristic sequences. So this is an infinite tree. Obviously, I didn't search all of it. I rejected those sequences where R3AN is not strictly increasing right from the start. Then I used something called the myhill narode theorem, um, which uh, is a, a basic theorem from automata theory. I found the size of the smallest automaton that's compatible with examples. And if it's too large, I threw it away because I figured I wouldn't have any hope of understanding how it would behave. And after some computation, then I was left with potential counterexamples to Dombey's uh, conjecture generated by small finite automata with a small number of states. And in fact, the very first one that I tried worked right away. So um, now you might ask, well, you know, your example is not so satisfying because you had this really sparse set. Would there be an example where F has positive density? And the, the answer is yes, you can even find examples with positive density. So if you let F be the set of natural numbers whose base two expansion is of even length and begins with one, one. So there are the first few terms of F. Then F is of positive lower density. And once again, R3 and the complement of F n is strictly increasing. And you can prove this using exactly the same technique as before. Um, now, when I showed this to Jason Bell, he said, oh, well, you know, we don't need all that. We can just use the binomial theorem. So he, he, he came up with the following theorem. He said, suppose you have some set F and suppose you have its uh, associated power series. And suppose the sum of the first N plus one terms of F is, 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 is sigma of F. It's not too big. It's little o of N to the alpha, where alpha is less than K minus two over K then RKAN is eventually strictly increasing. And the way he did this was he just said, okay, what is this the first difference of this RKAN? It's just the coefficient of X to the N in this expression in terms of rational functions. And then we can just expand this using the binomial theorem and estimating the size of the coefficients. So with that, then you can get a whole class of counterexamples to Dombey's conjecture. And I should say that just very recently, this condition that we had, namely k minus two over k for the exponent alpha, that was recently improved by uh, Shandor Kish. 
and Shaba Shandor and Quan He Wang uh, Yang, and they've improved it to K minus two over K minus one, which is optimal. And that was uh, just recently appeared on the archive. Okay, so um, let's see here. Um, I have a few more things that I think I will just skip. Um, I want to say that in addition to proving things about specific sequences, so you might think, uh, well, this tool is of limited value because you know you can do things for the, like the two a more sequence, which is one sequence, or the the Rudin Shapiro set, which is one set. But you know, in analytic number theory, we're interested in proving things about whole classes of things. Well, we can do that with Walnut for some things. So we can actually use Walnut um, to prove results about families of uncountably many sequences, provided they are all generated by automata in a certain way. And an example is something called the paper folding numbers. So the paper folding numbers, they were studied by people like uh, Michel Mendes France and, um, and uh, uh, Tannenbaum and others. Uh, they are sequences that come from iterated folding of a piece of paper. So when you take a piece of paper and you fold it, you have two choices. You can either fold it in such a way that you get a hill, or you can fold it in such a way that you get a valley. And then if once you fold it in half, you can do it again. So if I do that, I'm going to introduce a valley here. If I do this, I'm going to introduce a hill. And so at every stage, every time you fold it more and more and more, you can introduce a hill or a valley. So that gives you uncountably many infinite sequences after you fold infinitely many times and then unfold the paper and look at it. So it gives a, a certain set depending on this sequence of folding choices. And what you can prove with Walnut is uh, for all paper folding sequences, F, every N, bigger than or equal to 15 is the sum of three elements of S of F. And this bound 15 is optimal. So there you can actually prove results about uncountably many sequences using this finite tool. Okay, so back to these conjectures, I mentioned three and I'll just summarize them uh, for your interest. For the Rudin Shapiro set, we have R4, Rn, is strictly increasing provided n is at least 196. For the odious numbers, r6 is strictly increasing for n greater than or equal to six. And for the evil numbers, it's strictly increasing for n greater than or equal to 38. Nobody knows how to do these now, as far as I know. Um, so to, to summarize, uh, automata combinatorics on words can be used to pr prove new theorems for, for additive number theory. Sometimes the theorems can be proven purely mechanically just by doing a computation. Sometimes the computations require a lot of space and time. I didn't say how bad it could be, but I'll tell you now that in the worst case, if there are n alternating quantifiers, then the running time is something like two to the two to the two to the two to the two to the, where the number power of twos is the number of alternating quantifiers to the P of N, where P is a polynomial based on the automaton. So that can be pretty bad. The weird thing is those bad examples just don't come up when we're trying to prove stuff like this that people actually want to prove, or at least they don't come up very often. Um, the, the, te the techniques that I pr presented, so the other bad news is you can't use any of this for things like primes and squares, which you know are the traditional uh, primes and powers of integers, which are the traditional uh, interests of uh, uh, of additive number theorists ever since Goldbach and Waring and people like this, at least directly. So if you're interested in this, there are some references. This uh, the, the slides will also be on my homepage. Um, so you can you see them that way. Um, a little bit of shameless self-promotion is I also wrote a book. Uh, which tells you uh, hundreds and hundreds of different things you can prove with this approach. 
It's it's both a an introduction to combinatorics on words, which is the area that that I work in currently, and also like a manual of how to prove all these things in combinatorics on words using Walnut. So um, if you're interested in it, you can find more about it there. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Oh, thank you very much. Um, questions for Jeffrey? I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Uh, Jeffrey at the end mentioned uh, if you have lots of alternating quantifiers. So there's something, I haven't seen this since graduate school, but there's something in recursion theory called the recursive hierarchy. And roughly speaking, uh, they measure the complexity of a set by how much alternation of quantifiers happens. And when I took the course, in fact, with Hartley Rogers, he pointed out that most of the big mathematics theorems their goal is to reduce the number of quantifiers. If you take a statement with several alternating quantifiers, the whole point of the theorem, I'm talking about the big theorems like Gauss's theorem and, 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 and all the other theorems in calculus, what they do is they reduce the number of quantifiers. So that's just a pitch that you're not gonna find these things because there's probably some theorem that will have simplified it already, making your work easy. Yeah, so um, the bound that I gave is actually a, a lower bound too, so it's not reducible in general. Right? You're not you're not going to be able to reduce the running time in any substantial way. Right, but be... if you have a theorem, the theorem might re might say instead of proving this, prove that, and the, the equivalent theorem will have less alternating quantifiers. Oh yeah, absolutely. But uh, unfortunately, uh, you know. Uh, so, so, so there are certainly examples of this where you can reduce the number of quantifiers, and examples of this in in my book uh, to to speed up things. Um, there's lots of other tricks, like you can find logically equivalent statements that run much faster, uh, just from you know just because the automata happen to be slightly different. Um, it's still a little mysterious to us exactly when we're going to get really bad behavior and when we're not. And, um, you know, I, I certainly would be interested in anything that could predict how bad things are going to be, but that's also probably impossible in general. Um, uh, I remember reading um, something in the literature within the past few years that was complaining about alternating quantifiers and said something like, well, you know, uh, no theorem that anybody really wants to prove has five or six alternating quantifiers. But in fact, even some of the most basic things that we want to do in automata theory, like the pumping lemma, you've got four or five alternating quantifiers just in the statement, right? Because it says something like for all languages L, uh, for, for all L, uh, L regular implies that for, for all N, uh, there exists a decomposition, that there exists a bound uh, M such that for all N greater than or equal to M, if Z is a string of length N, then it can be, there exists a decomposition such that for all, you know, many statements require five or six alternating quantifiers. So, uh, you know, many properties require it too, if you, if you write it kind of at the very lowest level. So, we're sort of stuck with that for for many interesting things that we want to say. Uh, Jeff, could you close your screen share? Yep, I was just I kept it up because I thought maybe somebody would ask something about a particular slide. Questions for Jeff that with or without yeah, so the Jeff, slides? Yeah, uh, well, I don't know if you need the slides for this. Uh, if I've got uh, some interesting interesting to me arithmetic function. Uh, how hard is it to decide if it has one of these linear representations or not? Um, let's see. I, I think I stopped. Did I stop the share uh, successfully? Yes. yes. No, it's good. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, uh, so, so, so it, it's undecidable in general, um, you know, if your class of functions is chosen from anything reasonable, it's going to be undecidable whether it has a linear representation. 
um, you know, uh, anything that is likely to have a linear representation is is almost certainly going to be strongly tied to the base B representation of N in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there, I didn't say, because I, I cut out a little early on some of the slides, that you can also do this for other kinds of representations like Fibonacci representation. So if you're interested in things like floor of N alpha, for alpha irrational, which I know you are and many other people are, you can play the same game there. And in fact, one of the things that I did with um, uh, a really brilliant uh, former student named Luke Schaefer and really good uh, people at, uh, uh, at at Illinois and other places is it turns out that the first order theory of the Sturmian words is also decidable. So. Um, any any first order statement you can make about Sturmian words can be decided in principle by a decision procedure. And in the paper we wrote, we gave a bunch of examples uh, of, of of classical theorems about Sturmian words that you can do with this software called Pican. Pican is is competing software to 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 Walnut that was developed by people at uh, at, at Illinois. Unfortunately, the principal architect of the Pican system, the software system, was a, a very brilliant uh, young guy who died of uh, terrible cancer uh, shortly after working on the project. So I'm not sure it will ever continue, but it, it, it was uh, you know, a, a real loss to, to the Combinatorics on Words community. So, so, so sorry, so it was a kind of long-winded answer, but to sum up, we, we can do some of these things even for like sums of floor of N alpha kind of things. Uh, so you mentioned the myhill naroda theorem. Yeah. Can you say a few more words about that? What is that? How does that work? Um, so it's basically a theorem that, that, that says a, 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 a language is uh, accepted by a finite automaton if and only if some set of equivalents relation so some equivalence relation has finitely many equivalence classes and the particular equivalence relation that's involved is um, uh, uh, two strings are said to be equivalent if you can't distinguish them by uh, suffixing them with the same thing and then seeing whether that's accepted or not accepted um, so if you want to guess the way i did whether something is generated by an automaton, you can say, okay, let's let's try to see whether the prefix one, two, three is equivalent to the prefix three, four, five, six by sticking stuff after them and seeing whether it is the, the, the binary, it, it, whether it's in the set or not that you're interested in. And if you guess that this pattern agrees for the first thousand strings that you try, that it will go on forever, then you can guess an automaton that, that might or might not be true, but it is at least consistent with the data. So you can find so, sort of the smallest automaton that is consistent with the data that you have. And then once you have it, you can prove it with walnut. So you, you guess it and then prove it. Uh, so the, the guess is, is of course, uh, not rigorous, but then the walnut proof is. Right. So it's kind of fun that way. And we can do the same sort of uh, the same sort of trick on deciding if it has a linear representation. Uh, um, yes, 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 yes. Uh, because having a linear representation is equivalent to something called being k-regular, and then you can do the same thing except instead of an automaton, now you're just solving some systems of linear equations. So, so I have some code written in something that no one has mentioned so far, which is APL, uh, a long ago language, but I still use it daily. Um, that you know, you, you give it a sequence, and it will try to determine whether or not there's a linear representation for it. I think also um, uh, some other people have similar similar things. And I'm blocking right now on the name, but. Oh, Sorry. Eric Rowland. Eric Rowland has some stuff written in Mathematica. 
So have you gone through the entire OEIS? And I did. So it's a good question. I did this long ago, back when the, the OEIS had like 35,000 sequences in it. And, um, uh, you know, you get a lot of uninteresting hits because, for example, every polynomial has a linear representation. And then you get a lot of false hits just because there's not enough data and you, you know, but, but, but then we wrote some papers called the, um, Alusha and I wrote two papers called the ring of K regular sequences. And in those papers, we gave some of the many examples that we found from Sloan's database. So the, the most interesting one was um, uh, the, the three attic valuation of some binomial sum, which was guessed to be three regular by this procedure and the relations were guessed. And then this was recently proven by a Chinese mathematician uh, a year or two ago, eventually. So. Other questions or comments for Jeff? Yes, Peter. Hello, hello. Yes, so, um, a question from the um, logic and automata theory viewpoints. Um, I was wondering whether there would be any advantage to um, using a essentially a different um, recognizing device for regular languages. Um, I particularly had in mind a two-way automata. Um, now, the reason that would be of interest logically is because they're known to have a very, very close connection with linear logic instead despite having the same recognizing powers as standard finite state automata? Yeah, so it's a good question. And, um, you know, we haven't tried it. So, I mean, the, the blow up that arises just because we have to do determinization. Um, and I think, you know, with two-way automata, you don't, you, you can't escape that issue there either. You still have to pay a price for determinization. So, um, uh so, so I'm not sure. I mean, our implementation is just with DFAs, um, but there's no, yeah. no, no particular reason why one couldn't use alternating finite automata or something like this. Um, and uh, the question is, would you, uh, would you gain anything? And and maybe you would, but you're never going to be able to escape the two to the two to the two to the two to the n lower bound, which is already known for these things. So. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. But you know, uh, constant factors make a real, really big difference, especially when they're up at the top of a chain of twos. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Uh, if not, let me end with a preview of coming attractions. Our uh, last seminar for the semester is next week, and our speaker is Sayak Sengupta, who is here. Uh, actually, Sayak, if, uh, yeah. if you could unmute and just uh, say a word or two what you're going to talk about. Oh, um, I'm going to talk about something that uh, was a problem, which was basically by a person I was working with before, uh, Professor Adrian Vasu. So, um, the idea originated from a paper by Professor Borisov. And uh, in that he was trying to develop some sort of trap for polynomial maps so that um, when you have a fixed point after some like large enough n, when you take the iteration of the polynomial for a large enough n, then the whole thing that the whole variety would basically go to that fixed point. So it, the idea was coming from that, and the new problem was developed in the uh, pol polynomial ring formatting one variable, uh, especially over z. So my talk will be on polynomials over z in one variable. So you look at some polynomial, and you also fix a starting number, and then we look at the orbit of that number. So it's in other words, let's say your polynomial is u, and your uh, integer is r, then you look at all the numbers u of r and then u of u of r and so on. You look at this orbit. And then two questions arise. The first question is, do we hit zero at uh, in, in, in any point of the orbit? So 
that is the first question and for which particular uh, use and what are the starting points is going to be if we had zero. So that is one classification that we can do. And another question is, what happens if we don't hit zero? So if we don't hit zero, can we always get an iteration for every prime such that modulo that prime, you are going to hit zero? So there are two classifications. I mean, of course, if you hit zero in, 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 one, uh, in one of the numbers in the orbit, then obviously for all primes, you can take that particular number to be the iteration. So you're good. You're, you're going to get um, like all the primes in that way. But if you don't hit zero, then for which polynomials do we have that? So my results show that uh, basically if you don't have zero, then the only polynomials for which this kind of scenarios make sense for which you basically get uh, all the primes, but I mean, it doesn't have to be all the primes. It, it, it can be uh, almost all, but finitely many primes. If, even if that scenario is in question, then the only polynomials that make sense are the linear polynomials. And then I classify all the linear polynomials. So I was not able to get this like one week ago, but recently I found out a paper by uh, Professor Tom Scanlon and Professor Tom Tucker. And they, in one paper, it was uh, a paper in annals. So they, they have like a really technical result whose proof is quite long and very, very detailed. And I was able to see that a very particular case of that can be used in, in my case. And um, it turns out that using that particular theorem, the, 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 the only thing that works are the linear polynomials. So initially I was, I, I was uh, my paper was based on the idea that only I could do this for linear polynomials. And now I know that it can only be done for linear polynomials. So I don't have to look any further. So now I have a complete classification of all the, all the polynomials that, that can have this kind of uh, interesting properties. All right, good, thank you. Next week. <laughs> Be there or be square. Uh, and you, have to be, you have to watch it when you say be square. I mean, I might have some technical meeting around here. <laughs> uh, uh, any um, other questions, comments, remarks before we go? Great talk. <laughs> yeah, great, great results. Yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, everyone. I thank our speaker again and um, be back uh, next Thursday. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye.